Welcome back to the Book Mavens. I'm Rachel. This is Amanda. And today we're going to be studying our Austin ranking. This is be our last video that we will shoot for our Falling for Austin project. And so we are going to reevaluate, did our rankings change since our first video? Did they stay the same? And just kind of overall reflections of the books as a whole, our favorite characters, rakes, side characters, our least favorites, and just kind of a general um, overview of mm -hmm. how we felt about completing this project. Yeah. So how do you feel, Rachel? <laughs> how now do I you feel? Went well, through them again. It was fun to revisit. It's fun always to hear other people's perspectives on some, you know, beloved characters uh, and to evaluate um, just why, why people love them so much. Why are they, why are they still so relevant today? And to really focus on the role of the kind of female heroine mm. in her books because she writes them in such a different way. And to talk about a fantasy versus reality uh, in terms of feminism uh, in this time period in the 18th century, I think is really fascinating and I think it's worth exploring. And so I really enjoy doing a dive on Austin. There are certainly ones that we've read that I don't really feel a need to revisit at any particular time, but I've been exposed to the story. I've been exposed to those characters and have broken those down. So I feel like that was definitely worthwhile to do. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things I saw reading them so close together was you really did get to see the highlight of how different her books are from each other. Like she, which I had, I find rather fascinating because I just didn't think about it. <clears throat> her books are, I mean, they all center around a female heroine but they're all structured um, so differently from each other, where they pick up with the character, what they're studying, even like the social class of the characters has some range in it. Yeah. Um, it, it really was interesting to watch kind of the progression of her writing ability kind of as you went through. Uh, and I just, Overall, I would say I definitely enjoyed it, but I agree with Rachel that there are some that I don't necessarily <laughs> feel a need to read again. But I am glad that I have read them all. Well, they're all incredibly different stories. Mm -hmm. You can't really lump Austin to say, well, I read one, one Austin. I've read them all. They're all incredibly different. Mm -hmm. And so you definitely have some that have themes that are more relatable, perhaps, for some of us. And some that are a little outside of perhaps our level of comfort or relatability that we may like less. Um and the fact that we're reading them as modern women, I think definitely shapes how we view some of the storylines and character development and things like that. Oh yeah, for sure. I definitely struggled often with like <laughs> my modern sensibilities and also being, a, a, you know, in my thirties, a single woman and like watching her characters and the struggle. Cause a lot of it, I mean, almost all of the struggles have at least a, a cornerstone in are they married or not? Or how are their marriages you know, in comparison to each other. And so I definitely, <laughs> there were moments where I struggled with that because I consider myself a very independent person. <clears throat> and so, you know, putting your modern sensibilities on it did make for a different take. Did, Rachel, going through this for you, second and sometimes third or fourth time on some of these books, mm -hmm. has any of your rankings changed, your original rankings? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure about my ranking. I, we had put Northanger Abbey at the bottom together and uh, I'm very happy with or Northanger Abbey staying there and kind of sharing the bottom slot with Mansfield Park. And those are very different books, very different tones, but it comes down to how I felt about the characters in both of those books because I found Catherine to be tremendously irritating I know, but at least I, I don't know. For but there were yeah. more things that happened. I feel like there was, it was more exciting of a book. And Till yeah. Me, I think, is a, is a good Austin leading man. I, I don't have any issues with Till Me, and I liked his sister, and I liked all of that. I hated the, with, the, with she, their father, she and she is immature. just it's just so immature. And, and having to kind of read through her internalized... Um, Angst. I, yeah, I just didn't. It really wasn't no other for way me. to describe Catherine other than yes. angsty. <laughs> very angsty. So I that was something that I really struggled to relate 
as a woman who's also in my 30s, that the distance there between that kind of adolescent brain, you just don't get that perspective in the other ones mm -hmm. quite as much. And so that just felt incredibly young and incredibly silly when really we're operating on a very adult sphere. So for me, Northanger Abbey was really a tough pill to swallow. And then um, when we talk about Mansfield Park, which is also my lowest on the low. She did a tag. I did. Uh, because Fanny Price is also a tremendously irritating character for just a completely different reason. And um, I watched this really great booktuber who was on here who really did a really interesting breakdown and talking about character foils and that one of the reasons why perhaps Fanny Price isn't such a beloved character is because she's not really given um, you don't really get to see another or like more conservative character. So she's not in the middle. We like things in the mm -hmm. middle. We like them to have both, you know, more kind of liberalized silliness as well as those conservative aspects of sensibilities that Austin, I think, really highlights in a lot of her books where she's just too far on the conservative side. So she comes up and I've said this before, very priggish to me, just very, um, self-satisfied and kind of smug in her superiority to those around her in terms of just ethics and morality mm. and I find that to be very displeasing <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it like I feel her judging me through the book like and it's not that I think that I'm a wild and crazy kid or anything but like I just she I find her to be a very unrelatable character in the fact that she herself displays so few so few flaws mm -hmm. and doesn't stand for flaws in others and I just find that to be yeah just kind of irritating <laughs> not uh not the most pleasant character like I just really didn't invest in her story like I did with some of her other heroines so they both your, share the bottom tier for me did any of your tops change or move down no I mean mm -hmm. I think Pride and Prejudice is like Pride yeah. and Prejudice is fabulous I it's it'll stay my number one it's the adaptations that have been done with Pride and Prejudice are great. Uh, the modern adaptations like Bridget Jones' Diary, I mean, I love those. I love how, and there are so many, there are many more. I just mentioned a couple, but like they're, it's such a great story that has set up a storyline that so many other author, authors have kind of taken under their wing. And, you know, these people who just don't get along, who have to kind of break down um, their perceptions of the other person and really see each other for who they really are. And I think that that's something that that kind of um, storyline has stayed really relevant into today's world. So I really find that Pride and Prejudice was her most impactful book in terms of societal change and feminism and things mm. like that. So I, it's just, it really holds strong and I think it deserves that kind of like that top tier placing there. Yeah, I agree. I think Pride and Prejudice, well, I, it, yeah, it didn't move for me, but I agree. Pride and Prejudice really does deserve all of the credit that it gets as a story, the way it's written, the characters. I mean, it really is mm -hmm. a masterpiece. It's really great. Okay. Any of the other ones you want to talk about in your ring? Um, you know, Sense and Sensibility. I have a soft spot for Sense and Sensibility. I do love that sister relationship. Um, I love the idea of these, these women, these young women just trying to hold things together and their different perceptions on life, Eleanor, in terms of just just so internalizes everything while Marianne's mm -hmm. so externalized. They make such perfect foils for each other that it's such an enjoyable read. And so I still, that's that's more of a comfort cozy Austin for me where I can go back. I know what my expectations are for that story and it's very comfortable. It's a comfortable one for me. Yeah. And Persuasion is up there as well. I mean, it's in, it's in my fourth spot, but truly Persuasion is a great book. When you're talking about, especially I think like the top four, I find them to be pretty enjoyable. We obviously differ about Emma, but I, I enjoy Emma because Emma makes me giggle. She is a tremendously flawed character, but she, to me, out of all of the characters, shows the most character growth. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that in terms of just character development in general, because that is something I look for, for me to be able to judge it a good book. And so she really demonstrates what I look for. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, she stays in that spot for me. And Persuasion's a great book. It's a great letter. Oh, well, Persuasion, I think, yeah. is the best letter of all the letters. Ugh. And as I grow older, I have a deeper appreciation for that with them being older than the mm -hmm. other characters. I can't really say that they're, they're not yeah. older necessarily in their I mean, 20s and 30s. Yeah, so it's... <laughs> so it's like, 
But I like that they have a little life lived as mm -hmm. opposed to our other heroines that are in their late teens and early 20s. So it's it's a different perspective. Yeah. And so as we age, I think that there's more and more appreciation, mm -hmm. I think, for for Anne. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I agree. So my top three did not change. No. Sense and Sensibility is still my favorite um, because I love Eleanor as a character. I love the relationship between sisters. I'm also very close to my sister. So I love that it's it's really a love story to sisterly relationships as much as it is a romance. Mm -hmm. which I love and then Pride and Prejudice of course because it's so good and then Persuasion and I have to admit Persuasion hit me just right this time which if you watch the Persuasion video the weather's changing here mm -hmm. it was just such a perfect fall read you know fall such a transitional time I don't know it was just really hitting all the right buttons for me this time and I and like I said that letter is just my number one favorite and it because it is a little bit shorter it's just kind of an easy it's a quick read. Yeah, yeah, I found it to nice. be just an, an easy, delightful read. Um, so my top three stayed the same. Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, and Persuasion. My bottom three <laughs> is definitely where I think all of them moved. All three of them moved, at least, you know, mm -hmm. in relationship to each other. So I had at the bottom Northanger Abbey, <laughs> which I have actually moved <laughs> up a slot. So Mansfield Park has sunk rapidly to the bottom. <laughs> Because it turns out, the movies made them much more interesting than it was to actually read it. And it just felt like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, about not very much, to be honest. Everything exciting doesn't in happen like, in yeah. the actual story. Right. Or, the, and the only movement is like right there at the end. So you read this very long book for like what I felt That's was long. not a very lot of payoff. So Mansfield Park has dropped to the bottom for me. And, but, and Northanger Abbey goes above it because while Northanger Abbey is very silly, I like that it knows that it's silly and it's very short. So I, honestly, the <laughs> length really did matter to me in terms of I enjoyed-ish reading Northanger Abbey because, because of its length, it did move fairly quickly. It did. There were things happening. And Mansfield Park, I really slogged through. So I moved, I switched those and then of course that moves Emma up a slot because it is a, it is the superior written book to me of the three. Emma has a lot more plot than Mansfield Bart although they started a little bit similar on the like taking a long time to really get anywhere but like the character development and the character growth in Emma is just much stronger I felt like than in the other books. So Emma has moved up to number three. Rachel's goal was successful Emma moved. And it was never the goal to make it number one. No. I wasn't did, shooting yeah. for that. I just didn't think it belonged she just as low it as move. she had it. <laughs> yes. And it did. Now that I've read it. Now. From an objective place. Yes. And I have to admit, I will have to say that for me, the bottom three are probably ones that I won't return to. But mm -hmm. the top three, I definitely will. Um, I think I just... I just loved them so much. They were just so good. So I, I definitely for me, that was my movement. I think I'll still read. I'll read my top four because I put Persuasion in the fourth spot and I will reread Persuasion again. It's just those bottom two for me. I have no desire to touch Northanger Abbey and Mansfield Park again. I don't need to. They can just shove it. But if you're going to the watch Nor the Northanger Abbey movie, you need to do it with a friend because it's. <laughs> way more fun it's way more enjoyable if you're both at, laughing yeah. at the ridiculousness of the storyline yes. do it with a friend Prime. yeah <laughs> rachel oh favorite heroine that's so tough i have a hard time with that one my favorite heroine that's so hard i would have said if you'd asked me at the beginning of the story i'd have said eleanor hands down but Anne just hit me yeah, so really differently this time. I really was. She was just really hitting me differently this time. And I think it's like you said, because she's mature. Yeah. It's the last one Austin wrote. So she was in her, I think her thirties mm -hmm. or forties. And Anne is looking that. back on like things she regrets in life, which, you know, the older you get, the more of that you do. I think sure, it just sure. really hit different this time. So that is so hard. She's a good one. She's she a very, a she's the one. most mature. I'm going to give a tie to Eleanor and Anne in this moment. That's what I'm going to do. I love me some Lizzie Bennett because she was such a modern feminist at a time when that wasn't really permitted. And I do love that she speaks her mind. And I do like that she has flaws, but is able to see those flaws and make that right. So I do appreciate her as a character tremendously. 
her lines, I think, are probably some of the she best. She has some great lines. Lizzie I reminds really me do. of you, to be to be very honest. And I'm not just saying that. Like, if you knew Rachel in real life, <laughs> she's, she gives off a very strong Lizzie Bennett, Bennett vibe. She's very self-assured. She is very confident in herself. And she'll tell you what she thinks. I do. Not in a mean way, but like... Sometimes. It depends. Well, <laughs> it depends on, on how strongly I feel about it. But I can be pretty argumentative sometimes. And perhaps that is the Lizzie in me. I have a hard time giving up a point if I feel like it's super relevant. So, yeah. Like a bulldog. <laughs> like, I just, I just, like, I just don't want to let it go. Um, yeah, I could be pretty stubborn. Perhaps that stubbornness with Lizzie Bennett. That's that's definitely true. Um, See, I was thinking you're just yeah. as confident as her. Oh, well, I look at her flaws, too, because Lizzie Bennett isn't a perfect character. And that's, that's true. what makes her so compelling, because nobody's perfect. Right. And that's why Fanny Price is irritating <laughs> because she's written in such a, a perfect way. And I hate that you, know, because you can look at her as a victim of childhood trauma and things like that. And mm -hmm. that's perhaps why so many things that she does are defense mechanisms. But I still find her just horrible to read. <laughs> I, think that I do find her also a very interesting comparative heroine in the sense yes. of like she is the poor relation, not mm -hmm. is could be poor after their father died or what. Right. Like, she is the poor relation in their household. And, you know, she's got that one aunt who's always telling her that. And then, like, everybody else telling her how valuable she is. Which, you know, which makes her a little bit more unique amongst the heroines. In that the rest of them either just have, you know, the prospect of poverty. Or... Oh, I don't know. I think well, sense and sensibility. Well, yeah, you're right. Because they, they do become poor. But I guess yes. she doesn't have anything to compare it to. Like, they had, you know, they lived very comfortably and then had to move. She's, which I think, think it's interesting. Could. It's interesting because, yeah, you talk about a lot of more of a, a upward mobility that happens where a sense of sensibility, it's a downward position because yeah. they had a high social standing at one point in time. All right, Jane yeah. Austen. Let me see what you did. I have to say, I'm much, my, my, I get kinder towards Fanny the longer it is since I read it. <laughs> <laughs> may have to happen, yeah, may have to happen to many people. Perhaps. And why people talk about that book being so great. And then I'm like, mm, but have you read it recently? <laughs> Cause but that's what we talked about. We talked about why it was so popular at the time that it came out mm -hmm. to rehash that is because Fanny Price was the feminine ideal for the time. Lizzie Bennett was the fantasy, that person where you really couldn't do that. You really couldn't navigate society the way that Lizzie Bennett does um, in terms of her outspokenness and the fact of how high she rose social status wise would not have been the norm so yes she's very unique that way where fanny price would seem to be more the reality and something to strive for to be quiet and patient and mm -hmm. that good things will come if you are that way it just makes for a really slow boring read yeah but honestly but okay but also that's kind of how i feel like life I, maybe that is it it's more realistic to life because i feel like yeah that's really how i think I think good things come to people who wait, and mm. but you know, but you are, as you always point out, then there wouldn't be anything interesting to read. This would not be a good story. There so, wouldn't. There's no conflict. But, but you know, but you're a modern woman. You're proactive in getting the things that you true. want, right? She just kind of suffers in silence. I mean, who wants to do that? It makes for, like I said, a super not very thrilling read. Excellent points. Yeah, <laughs> like I really like Marianne okay. Dashwood. I'm not gonna lie. I like that she's she and Lizzie Bennett have a lot of parallels for me in their unwillingness to kind of hide their light behind the bushel kind of effect mm. that they're going to be who they're going to be and kind of damn the consequences <laughs> in a way. And I Marianne almost did it a little too much. She almost killed God, she, yes, she almost died. That is true. Or but I a little darn the consequences attitude. But I do <laughs> like how she comes back to earth in a way where she doesn't necessarily give up those qualities about herself she's just learned to open her eyes and see qualities in other people that she had missed before and I think that that's good I think it's a broadening of her perspective okay I just like right there had this thought that okay. that reminds me exactly what happens with Louisa Musgrove because you remember mm -hmm. how we talked about like it does seem a little bit yeah. maybe not strange but like everybody talks about like what a strange partnership he's so serious and she's so like you know flirty mm -hmm. flighty but honestly after her your death experience she really does settle in in a very similar way to Marianne and I think like, you you figure out the things that are really important to mm -hmm. you and being passionate and all of those things are very important it's not about losing those things in yourself but valuing I think a quietness in somebody else mm -hmm. I think is really 
Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, you see that? Yeah. There you there's go. A, there's a comparison there. Absolutely. This makes me like persuade yeah. even more. There you go. All right. Uh, yeah. You're... I like the fiery ones. I like the ones who aren't afraid to burn it down, you know, kind of way <laughs> to, to make things happen. Like Lizzie Bennett says, I'm not going to marry Collins. I, you don't, you're not going to just sell me off. And yeah. Marianne is like, you know, I'm not going to hide my feelings for someone. I feel passionately. I should be able to feel that way. And, you know, really kind of goes for it. And I appreciate those things. I do. Yeah. They both kind of get stomped on for it. But, you know, everything works out in the end. Happily ever after. Oh, you know, Austin was big on that. So. I mean, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Who's our least favorite? Apparently. Fanny Press. Oh, Fanny Press. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you stick up for her all the time. Well, I'm just really saying, funny. like, well, because in reality. I don't know. Catherine I'm might probably, be the worst. Well, but here's my thing. Cat, well, they're, this is the thing. They're both very young. But what what you find, and I, this is this is I find so interesting because this is where our personality difference really shows itself. <laughs> I am more forgiving of Fanny Price because I see that kind of like just quiet watching of things, more mm. that flaw in myself, just kind of like watching and just kind of judging people a little bit, but you know, a little bit like in just a normal way. <laughs> In a normal way. I don't know. In a normal, I like that. I just like that qualifier. In a normal you way. Know. Everybody is just scrolling through social media silently. True, true. Each other. True, true. I like that. In a normal way. I <laughs> Got it. Maybe it's just because Catherine is intentionally written to be slightly ridiculous. She is. And, you know, I don't know why, guys. It just, that is. But yeah, Fame Price is my least favorite. Maybe it's because you get to know Catherine better because you get more, like her internal dialogue is more entertaining. Oh, Price just draws. Favorite Austin man. Oh, that's tough. That is really tough. She writes men in a very. She writes more of a modern man perspective as well. Yeah. Very forgiving and very much more outwardly, I think, loving and affectionate. Mm hmm. Than I think that you would have gotten at the time. Well, I think like I'm all, being judgmental. I, think, I, was I, say, I think like all those men. Yeah, all romance writers, you write you write with is the woman's ideal, that and that's true. why they're so appealing to they it. Are so they're so like, appealing. Because I mean, Darcy is got the passionate, attractive, but then Captain Wentworth in that letter. It's mm -hmm. really you're feeling that Wentworth. I'm telling you, it's persuasion. Well, and I also her, I really. I have a huge crush on the actor who plays <laughs> him in the 1998. I should look up his name, but like, I, if I actually really like an actor or someone, I try to know as little about their personal life as possible. You don't want possible. to ruin it for you. Yeah, I don't want anything to ruin it for me. So, like, I know very little about I've been ruined people by I actually watch. I like, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything. I just want to enjoy the product. And I maybe that makes me not a good consumer, but like I don't want that makes you an excellent consumer. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't because <laughs> you're not going to stop consuming it. Yeah, I don't want to ruin the fairy tale. Like I want them to be that person in my brain. And so I need to not see them like shopping at Publix, like you know, <laughs> or engaging in bad behavior. Yeah, that either. You just don't. You can't respect them as an individual. Yeah, so yeah. That's what's it taints tough for the me. work. So anyway, but I have a I have a crush on him because I think he is just. <clears throat> I don't know if it's the voice or the stature. I don't know, but something something's working for you. I have a hard time too because I I will use the films to kind of fill in and give me a, mm -hmm. a mental picture of those characters and I can't I can't see anybody but Alan Rickman as Colonel Brandon oh, for me like, for a sense yeah, of sensibility and I so just good. love him so much and so that's that's really tough I yeah. really liked him I really liked Matthew McFadden as uh, Mr Darcy. Mm -hmm. I really did. I like both of those performances tremendously. So I guess this is so hard. Like I can't really decide. So it's like you can have a tie. It's like a tie. I think we're they're making the up best. The you can have a tie. I mean, but even on the page, Colonel Brandon is very compelling mm -hmm. for me because he has that tragic backstory. His understanding of who Marianne is, I really like that mm -hmm. a lot. And I love Darcy because Darcy starts off as a character that's actually pretty unlikable. And then you find out the reasons, perhaps, why he is the way he is. And um, he's just an onion. And okay. that he's just, yeah. Keep peeling and I just think that he's back. just somebody who's just socially awkward in a high social status. And I, 
And I can, I see it. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I like it. So he, he, yeah, when he, when you, when he slowly allows his layers to be peeled off and you can see this person who really has a tremendous amount to give to somebody else and who is incredibly honorable, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's very appealing. He's just like, he's just genuinely a good person deep down. He, he just doesn't know how to go about, you know, he just doesn't really know how to go around other people. <laughs> he really doesn't. So... You know, you know what? Come maybe out, Darcy would be a representation of someone being on the spectrum, or or just somebody coming out of post pandemic life. Cause, uh, <laughs> just a little, little, little awkward. Let me tell you, I was at a party not long after you know the restrictions left. I was at a birthday party, and I realized I'd been sitting by myself, just kind of watching things for fifteen minutes. Not unhappily, I was just <laughs> just, just kind of like sitting there eating my refreshments, just like watching. I realized I wasn't engaging with anybody at the party. And I was like, wow, I used to be good at small talk. I lost it. It's my Mr. Darcy moment. Who's your favorite Austin man? I don't know. It would have to be a tie, I think, between mm -hmm. Captain Wentworth mm -hmm. and... Oh, I don't know. Maybe not. I don't Is know. just Captain Wentworth for you now? No, you because I, I agree with everything you said about Mr. Darcy. I mean, I think yeah. Mr. Darcy is written to be the, like... I mean, he just appeals on many, he many does. levels. That he, there's more to him than you think. That he's really genuinely this great he's, person underneath. He's a little bit more complexly, or more complex, complexly. That's not even a word. <laughs> Somebody who, sure. just, who is just he's more complex than other men. He gets a mm -hmm. lot more page time. That's true. I think than others. So I think we feel a little bit more attached, perhaps, to him. But Wentworth gets quite a bit. That's you, true. You get some oh, stuff with idea. Wentworth. I, and it's a shorter book. So. It is a shorter book. I don't know. I struggle because like I do love, I love, I love so many. I love Colonel Brandon. I love, um, I love so many. I don't know that I can pick a favorite. I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm just going to say. Who's the least? Who's the least favorite? Is oh, who's my least easier? favorite? Um, my least favorite guy, Ed, Edmund. Edmund. Ed, yeah, Edmund from Mansfield Park. I just don't feel like he really... Same Z's. Yeah, I don't feel like he He's really develops. He's a lump, which is perfect because Fanny Price is also a lump. Two lumps together in lump happiness. Yeah, well, that's... There you go. Yeah. And they're very similar to each other. Yeah, and the, and since neither of their characters really changes in the book, like mm -hmm. yeah, like Edward... They're very static. Edward and Sense and Sensibility, he, even though you don't get a lot of page time in him, he really does... Like, he changes. He grows in the book in this like through that you know the whole debacle with lucy and then renouncing his fortune you know blah blah blah. like he yeah. has some actionable moments that you can yeah. like, look at and look at his deeper character edmund doesn't really i mean it's until the a, end when he like crawford when he yeah when he like cuts into crawford for a minute like that's kind of it you know for him mm -hmm. so probably him because i think he's probably one of the less developed ones so he's, he's my least favorite. favorite. He's my least favorite, too. I put him, and then I put Edward right there. Because I have issues with Edward. I know. About yeah. the leading on. I, yeah. But again, I don't really. I understand I don't, he has reasons yeah. for not doing what he, but I still see it as, there were other ways in which to solve that problem. But once again, we go back to, well, there wouldn't but be much wouldn't of a book. be a good story. So, yeah. But there's, there's something about that conflict that just, it's just personal. It just kind of yeah. just, just rubs me the wrong way. But I mean, I put Tilney above that. I actually think Tilney is a really well written Austin man, just with a. He deserves better than Catherine. <laughs> so I see it. Well, I think Catherine will grow and mature into something. Sure. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. I was going to say, you get such a small taste of her that it's kind of like, you know, I do kind of wish. It's kind of the same thing I wish with Emma. Like, I do wish that you would get to see more a little what's bit gonna later, happen like, after the marriage how are right. they going to become real adults but i kind of want that in all the books really i do want to know what happens next after the marriage but then again mm -hmm. that's not the story well i mean other authors have certainly taken taken that as a challenge mm -hmm. there are many authors who have written continuations of pride and prejudice to continue elizabeth and darcy's story which have been good some of them yeah. are quite good um, others not so much, but there are some out there that I think are, are really interesting mm -hmm. and more adult, I think, in terms of a modern adult perspective. So where they get into, I think more, um, I don't want to say necessarily like Regency romance because they've already, they're already married. It's like a romance novel, but they do focus on a different level of intimacy mm -hmm. between them when, you know, going from not being married and courting to 
being married and just trying to learn to live with each other too, which I think is very interesting and something that's not always covered in um, more like romance novel. Oh, settings. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> the rakes. Ranking the rakes. Mm. Which ones are the worst? Okay, well, here's the thing. Let Okay, do we mean the worst as in... The it's ones so hard, whose behavior like, was the worst or the ones that we enjoyed reading the least? Because that's different for it me. It is different, yeah. Because there are rakes that, like, their behavior, to me, makes them the worst. But the ones that I enjoyed their role in the story, their mm -hmm. role in the plot, mm -hmm. you know, who who was the most lovable of the rakes? Or, I, you know, I don't know. What, what, so what's our qualifier for I don't know. Best rake? <sighs> There are a lot of similarities with her rakes, I feel like. Like, they kind of mm -hmm. all end up being the same. They, they're generally charming. So, at least your initial um, impression. Yeah. You know, that somebody's funny. You know that they're going to be somehow nefarious as soon as they come on oh, yeah. the page. But, yeah. like, um, I think Wickham's really well developed. Wickham's an excellent rake. Yeah, he is an excellent rake. But he's, you know, he's pretty slimy. I think Willoughby, too. Willoughby is Willoughby, horribly slimy. Right, but I think he's well-written. He is incredibly well-written. I think those are the two one, two yeah. rakes that are the best the W's. written. Yeah, she liked the W's. The W's. The W's are the best written. But I also think that the father figure in Northanger Abbey, the colonel. But he's not the rake. He's not a rake, but, like, he's... There's but there not, is a rake. What's his face? Oh, that's right, the brother. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's awful. He's really he's he's slimy, slow. but he's not well-developed at all. He's not well-developed. So I'm going to put him at my least favorite mm -hmm. because... You forgot about him. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. He was forgettable. He was forgettable. I'm going to put him as my least favorite just because, like, his story was just slimy and not really pushing mm -hmm. the main story for it. At least with Willoughby. and Like, Willoughby had moments. And so even did, like, Frank Churchill, where they were, like, really involved in the story and, like, moving the, the development yeah. of the characters forward. Sure. And, like, showing their own changes in whatever form. I think Frank Churchill was, played a very pivotal part oh, yeah, in Emma, for sure. For sure. Well, the Northanger Abbey rakes are my least favorite. <laughs> just there are, there, are, there are barely a few. I didn't even think about Maybe she was other. just testing out rake plots. Perhaps. And seeing how they, you know, how it worked out in her mind. Because there's a couple different versions. Let's see. Mansfield Park. So our rake is... Or the Crawfords. The Crawfords. That's interesting because there's a female rake. We have a female rake in Persuasion. Right? Or a nefarious female character. Who's nefarious? The one that's involved with the father. Right? Oh, Mrs. Clay. Yeah. <gasps> oh, I didn't even think about her. Oh, okay. But I'm going to put the female rakes up higher because they were way more interesting. They are. They are way more They're interesting. more scandalous. Yeah. Because they're, because they're, you know, you expect it to be a male rake, and then there's... The just, I think it's just people who engage in poor behavior. That's true. Yeah. I mean, like Lydia, you can put in there. I do think it's so interesting in Persuasion that she is, like, not about Miss Clay at all. She's just like, mm-mm. Just like... Done. But she's so know. kind and generous about, like, everybody else in the story. But, like, some about Miss Clay rubs her wrong, and that is it. She that is, is so. That is such life, though. There are it's some so people true. that just rub you, the, and you're like, Whoa. You don't know why, but they just are. They just and are. everything they do, you just pick apart. Just to figure out just why they're doing what they're doing, and that there's got to be some bad thing they're trying to do. Ridiculous okay, characters. who's your favorite side character to read? Like, I don't know. I got to think about that. I know who mine is. <laughs> you laughing? Are they also ridiculous? Yes. They're also, but they're you also like Charlotte my, Lucas. They're also my favorite ridiculous character. But you like Charlotte Lucas? I do. A side character. I do, and she's. It's related to her. Oh, you're just Collins. <laughs> Collins this is Mr. Your Collins. favorite. Well, Mr. he's Collins been done so favorite. well in film too. He's and it's so really... fun to read because he's like, he's just. I think that's but I think that's why he's my favorite side character is because he's just so he's utterly got some ridiculous. Great lines though, just right. his utter ridiculousness. He's so and he's such a good part of the beginning of the story. Like I just love his You feel so many it. good reactions from the other characters too. <laughs> I'm like You could just see it. You could I, see them all just sitting there just looking at each other going, Did you just what? hear what I hear too? Like and around I didn't hallucinate that. There were so many great Mr. Collins things going around. <laughs> Somebody was doing reels as Mr. Collins. 
I, do you remember the meme I sent you of the couple's costume? It was Mr. Collins and some excellent potatoes. Yes. <laughs> you know, well done, internet. Mr. Collins is like, he's entertain he's entertainingly ridiculous because I think he's harmless. Like, mm -hmm. he doesn't hurt anybody. And yeah. he doesn't, I mean, he... He's incredibly shallow. He's but very it's, shallow, it's but he's, at least a, he's very uh, upfront with his shallowness. Like he's not like like Willoughby is not in a kind of sneaky way. and charming, yeah. and charming. And <laughs> Mr. Collins is just like, ta da! I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of some other good. I oh, my favorite side characters are the Jennings. Probably like the whole oh, yeah, yeah. that whole mm -hmm. family and sense and sensibility. They they just get yeah. Just on the level of just like just da, 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 at those poor girls all the time about their love life are hilarious. And then the Jennings, her daughter and her husband, who is just so sarcastic and amazing. I mean, they're just that whole side family. I'm just going to consider them like one lump side here. I mean, I thought that they were really, really good. And um, I mean, Sense and Sensibility has a has a quite broad mm -hmm. cast of characters, so I think I really enjoyed them just for the comedic moments because I think that Jane Austen, when she engages in comedy, does it incredibly Very well. well. Very and well. so, but it's few and far between sometimes, yeah. and so I really enjoyed those more lighthearted, just kind of generalized, just ridiculousness that you can see from some people, and it's just like Mr. Collins. Great, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Basically, anytime he opens his mouth, I smiled. Because <laughs> it's just like, you're just shaking your head. He's such a bless your heart. That's gracious. So if you're from the Southeast United States, you know what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> he's just, everything he says is just, bless his heart. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for our Falling for Austin project. We certainly hope that you enjoyed kind of reading through some classics with us and doing some deep dives into some character development and your favorite and least favorite characters. It's always a lot of fun. And I hope that you like and subscribe and join us next week when we will be discussing our next project and what we plan on reading for the rest of the year. So we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.